great. God is G-R-E-A-T. Great. A great God. You know what you think? When you say someone is great, what do you really mean? They're large. They're in charge. They're sovereign. They're above all. They're the biggest, the strongest, the best. And these are the words that I use to describe our God. And that's, that's the focus we're going to get on him. That he's great. And when we look at him and see how great he is, everything else just pales into comparison. Amen? So if you are able to physically stand, can I ask you just to stand briefly so we, we begin in the right way with a word of prayer. I, I thank God for his saints this morning. Father, we give you thanks for life, for strength, for health, for hope, for oh God, this morning. Even as we, we have another opportunity to break the bread of life and to hear what you have to say. And, oh God, we have another opportunity to magnify you, to bless you, to worship you, and, and to give you all that's yours, Lord. And so, Father, we pray today that this word will go forth with power, with might, that it will accomplish the work that you ordained it to do, even before the foundation of the world. I thank you for your people, and I pray, oh God, their hearts will be receptive. In the name of Jesus, we come against every spirit of slumber of, and of lethargy and of sloth, and we banish it from this place today, and we declare an alertness in the spirit realm to your people, so that they will hear what you have to say, O oh God, and they will act upon it. We pray that, Lord God, this word will change hearts and minds and it will draw people back to you and that at the end of the day your son jesus will be glorified and magnified it is in his name that we ask this thing this morning and let all god's people say amen you may be seated saints of god the first thing saints that i want you to learn about our god this morning which pastor confirmed that prayer meeting is four words great is thy faithfulness that's what god wants you to do this morning Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 24, they're very powerful verses, but we know it all the time. He says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. God is faithful. He never changes. He never fails. I like this scripture passage because it says, every morning, the mercies are renewed. You know why? Because Saturday's mercies are not good enough for Sunday. And what you get this morning, tomorrow, Monday comes, he gives you new mercies. And that's a faithful God. Even though we don't remain faithful and we may drift away and fall away from him, he still remains faithful. And he still extends new mercies to us every day. And there's that old hymn of Zion, and we sang it, I know. Pastor Pell led us in it at prayer meeting on Friday. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. And I love those old songs, saints. I love that old school song. Because it tells some deep, deep conviction. It was written by a man called Thomas Chisholm. And he was born in a log cabin somewhere in the States, I think in Kentucky. And he was in very, very poor health. I mean, by the time he was about 30, he couldn't work. And so he didn't have any much, much income stored up. And then towards the end of his life, he had it really, really rough. And he penned at him. He says his income had been impaired in his early years, and so he didn't really have anything now to live on. He didn't have any pension. He didn't have um, nobody to, to support him. But then he spoke of the faithfulness of God, that every morning new mercies came through for him. And so I want to speak into your lives today and tell you, no matter how this morning looked or how tomorrow will look, I want to tell you and confirm to you by God's word that his faithfulness will be renewed. He's going to take care of you tomorrow morning. He's going to see you too. We have to stand on faith. You see, it is the substance of things hoped for. You, you don't see it. Amen? So if it's, you can see it with your eyes, it's not faith. When you know that the tuition is due next month and you don't have the money, no, you are trusting God to provide it. That is faith. Amen? When you know that the mortgage is due and you don't have a job and you're getting a little bit from here there to put together, you're trusting God to provide that to, uh, to provide the rent by faith. And the word of God says, great is thy faithfulness. Faithfulness is just another word for covenant keeping. I love the Lord because he keeps covenant. People don't keep covenant these days, you know. People get married and, you know, two, three months after, you know, the covenant mash up. They, don't, they can't hold it. They're not going through. God is a covenant keeping God you know why we're here today because God made a covenant with Abraham he tell Abraham come outside look look up in the sky you see all them stars up there that nobody can number 
I'm going to make you descendants like the stars. <laughs> I don't even have one child yet. And I'm an old man. Amen. And Sarah is old. When the angel appeared to Sarah, she laughed. Because Sarah said, you've got to be joking. You know, and Abraham didn't have no kind of little pills to help him out. Bless God for covenant-keeping promises. When he made a promise to his people, he kept it. And because Abraham believed God, counted that faith as righteousness, no belief, all the patriarchs believe, and that's why we're here today, because we too believe. We haven't seen, but we believe, but we're trusting in the faithfulness of God. And since I want to tell you what God did for millions of his children through the ages, he's going to continue to do for you. He's never been proven wrong. He cannot fail. The prime minister says failure is not an option for his ministers and for the people in government. But God can't fail. Failure is not an option. It don't come in his vocabulary. There's no failure in God. He will be remain faithful. His faithfulness is great. It's not no kind of wishy-washy, wishy-washy. No, I'm faithful today. And I'm fa no, God is faithful. Every morning that sun rises in the east. And he sets in the West. Because God is faithful. He sends the rain. Oh, bless God and the just and the unjust. If it was up to some people, you wouldn't get no rain. You couldn't let, make life. You'd, be, you'd die. But because God is a faithful God, he takes care of you. When I look back over my life, this is an old song, and I think things over. I can truly say that I've been blessed. I can truly say that God has been good and been faithful. He doesn't have goodness, He is good. He doesn't have love, He is love. He's a faith. Oh, what a covenant keeping God. He says, You're old and your children may desert you, your father, mother, everybody, but He will never give you up. Never forsake you because he's a faithful God. Great is thy faithfulness. So a great God, great faithfulness. I want you to get that. God didn't bring us all this way to leave us. He doesn't start things and leave them halfway. He finishes the job because he's faithful. So I want you to trust in his faithfulness today. Because he's God. He's a faithful God. And his faithfulness is great. And the promises that he made to Abraham, pastor, are ours today. He promised us we're going to be above and not beneath. He promised us we're going to be blessed in Freetown. We're going to be blessed in English Harbor, in Cedar Grove, in, in Five Islands, in Grace Farm, in Casada Gardens. We will be blessed when we go out and when we come in. Because we serve a faithful God. He promised us that we will not beg for bread. What a God. He promised us that our children will be saved. Because, and he, you know what his promises are? Yes. And amen. It shall be so. He keeps promises. He keeps covenant. So I just want to encourage you today, regardless of how it looks, how it sounds, great is the faithfulness of our God. Amen. The second thing I want God's children to note this morning is this. Of all the gods men worship, our God is the greatest. <laughs> you know, Acts, Acts 4.12. I want you to turn there quickly. Acts 4.12. This is unique. And I don't want to be politically correct. I, I will not be. You see, God is to be declared and not debated. I don't want to debate. I'm just declaring what the word says. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name on the heaven given among men where we must be saved. So if it offends you, I'm sorry. But there's salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. Our God is to be declared. We sing this song, Our God is greater. Water you turn into wine, open the eyes of the blind. There is none like you. 
None like you. As far as I know, Haley Selassie never turned no water into no wine. And Buddha never opened the eyes of the blind. But we serve a God, come on, who raised the dead back to life. And tell the sea and the storm, like when Matthew read, you know, he said, peace, be still. And they say, what kind of man this is, even the winds and the waves, but they had to obey him because he brought them into existence. He spoke them into being. Let me tell you something, sins of God. Jesus Christ is who he said he is, who he was, and he's the biggest crazy man who ever walked this planet. But we know that the spirit of the living God that lives down inside of you, that witness to you that what you're hearing here is truth. And when you know that you know that you know, Nobody can move you off your crease, you see? Oh, help me, Holy Ghost, today. You cannot argue with the witness when you're going to a court of law. You remember the man whom Jesus opened the blind eyes? And they say, well, was he blind from birth? And whatever? And he spirit, the man said, look at him, there's a big man, ask him. He said, who cured? The man said, I don't have to know about who the man be or whatever your prophet or what. All I know that I was blind. Come on, and now I can see. Amen. I was dead in trespasses and sin and on my way to hell in a handbasket. I know that I am alive. And I can feel the rejuvenating, regenerating power of the Holy Ghost that lives down inside of me. And that spirit witnesses to my spirit that this word is true. You can't argue with witnesses if somebody was stricken with cancer and given over for death and they're alive because of Jesus Christ. They know him as healer. Come on. You were on your way to go to prison and you got miraculously the whole case show it. You know him as deliverer. You were wrapped up with all kind of bondage and addictions and all kind of things. And he set you free. Come on. You know God for yourself so nobody can be... Come on. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. When Jesus Christ said, let there be light, APUA can't say no. Because when he speaks something, it, 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 it comes into being. What a God. The Spirit of the Lord hovering over the waters and said, let there be light. And there was light. Because he's God all by himself. All the other gods in them are just little dibby dibby gods. That's the one true and living God. So if it offends other people, it's really, I'm sorry. But that's what the word says. And I believe this word is the infallible, unadulterated word of God. As the Holy Ghost moved upon men, they wrote it. And let me tell you, I challenge you to read it. And your life will never be the same again. You know why? Because it's life. It's word. It's living. It takes dead things and it brings them back to life. It changed. Let me tell you, all the rehab and stuff that can't change people, the only thing that can change people is the son of the living God that can come into you and transform you. When you see people here running and jumping, you wonder, what's wrong with these people? They have been transformed. They were for, we were former jailbirds. To be, 11th hour to be condemned. And then somebody wrote a free paper with his blood. And set you free. And the word says, when whom the Son of Man has set free is free indeed. Amen? Nobody can bless you like Jesus. Nobody can curse you when God has blessed you. You remember Balaam? Balaam, Balak hired a Obia man to curse Israel in Numbers. Let's go to Numbers 23, 19 to 20. He hired Balaam and he said, curse these people for me. This pronounced curses on them, send them back, frustrate them. And he had to admit to this man, let me tell you something, <laughs> I can't curse what God has blessed. And he wrote a powerful confession about God's greatness. Here's what Balaam said, Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless. He had blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Amen. Saints of God, let me tell you something. When God blesses, promotion does not come from the east or from the west 
are from the north or from the south. It comes from God. If God put you in a job and put you in a position, they can talk until they froth at their mouth. They can't move you. Because your life is hidden in Christ, in God. They cannot curse what God has blessed. And the word says, the people who know their God shall do exploits. So I want to put your minds at ease. If you come under trials and tribulation and persecution, and, no, don't worry about it. You are a child of the Most High God. And nobody can curse what God has blessed. Amen? I want you to hold on to that today because the God that you worship is the greatest. So take it easy. Don't try to fix the situation for, the, for yourself. Don't try to, to, to you, you're believing in God, but then you're trying to have other little gods to control the, the situation and to, to manipulate the situation. Because sometimes when you, when you do that, you, you get frustrated because you're trying to manipulate and you're trying to control your life and other people's life. And if you find sometimes that that tendency comes, I want you to try doing three things. If you, you find sometimes you can be overly controlling, you're trying to set the tone. Rather than dreading your helplessness, embrace it as a place of strength. The word of God says, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know why? When you are weak, Sister Riley, you then have to lean on God. When you lean on the everlasting arms, then he takes over. But if you think that you have the strength and you can do it in your own strength, he just leaves you. So rather than, than think that your helplessness or your weakness is, is a disadvantage, in fact, it is an advantage because that's when you learn to lean and rely on God. Be quick to express that helplessness to God. You remember Jehoshaphat? Jehoshaphat was faced with three invading armies, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Zeir. In 2 Chronicles, Chronicles 20, it's a powerful story. And they came up and Jehoshaphat said, Lord, look, look at this. These are people who, when we came into this land, we spared them. We, did, we gave them a break. These are people who I brought into the company and gave them a job. And now, look, they tried to get me fired. Amen? This is somebody that I took and brought into my home. Now they're trying to take away my wife or my husband. Amen? That's the Ammon Mount Zeir and, 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 and the Moab spirit. They, they don't like each other necessarily, you know. But they will come against the, up against the purpose of God and they will come up against you. And the word of God says, Jehoshaphat says, he prayed. He said, oh, our God, we have no power against this great multitude that is coming up against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Second Chronicles 20, 12. Our eyes are on you. And when you, do you speak out of your helplessness to God and you tell him, God, if you don't come through for me, I'm going under. God, I don't have nobody else to come through for me. God does the miraculous. The word of God, if you read, anytime you're discouraged, saints, and you're facing opposition, read 2 Chronicles 20. They turn against each other. <laughs> oh my, bless God. Ammon and Moab attack Mount Zeh. When they don't kill Mount Zeh, they turn on each other. And the word of God says, when the fighting done, the children of Israel went out and picked up plunder for three days. When your enemies done destroy themselves, God is going to let you plunder what was left. But you must choose to trust God, that he is the greatest God of all. The third thing you need to do, meditate on the scripture that speak about God's sovereignty, his greatness. Proverbs 16, 13 from the NIV version says, you can make your emotions and cast your votes, or, or the, the, the King James, cast your lots, but God has the final say. God has the final say. He has the last laugh. He does what pleases him. You know, we have a, a, a saying in, in the Caribbean that... Um, I don't have to give nobody no satisfaction. You, you know what that means? It's, it's like if I make a decision, I don't have to explain it to nobody. God is the same. God put up, he pulled down, he promote, he disappoint. He does, because he's God. And he doesn't have to explain himself. It's right there in, I think it's Daniel 4, 35. Let's bring it up. Let's read it. Angels, what's happening on the earth, God is controlling everything. Daniel 4, 35. And this will put you at ease, saints of God. 
such a weird great God. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say, none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? You can't ask God, well, why you do this? Or why you didn't do that? Or how God is sovereign. And sometimes he just wants you to stand still, to sit still, and to let him work things out. Saints, relax. And just start trusting God. He knows what he's doing, and he has your best interest at heart. You know why? Because of all the gods, G-O-D, small g, that men worship, there's a difference that you can tell. Why? Because he's the only God who ever gave his son. We sing it all the time. He's a God that cannot fail. He gave the best. He gave his son. So if he could give his son, what's a job? What's a house? What's a car? That's nothing to God. What's a new sanctuary? What's a billion? He will give you anything because he's God. He's, he's unique all by himself. He's great. And you just have to trust and hold on to his greatness. The third thing I want to leave with God's people this morning, as we look at the attributes of our great God, he's great, and he is greatly to be praised. We confessed it again this morning. Even as we, you know something, when you praise God, you don't notice the atmosphere changes? Praise cures dry times. Things are rough. Bless God. You don't have chicken, but you have sardine. Hallelujah. It does the body good. Just brush your teeth and go. We complain too much. We murmur too much, and God hates murmuring. Actually, it's the opposite of praise. Let's, let's go in the word. Numbers 11, verse 1. Since it's the opposite of praise, and God hates it. God doesn't like when people complain and they murmur. Mm. Numbers 11, verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp. God doesn't like people that murmur and never have nothing good to say. You know what I mean? I have a friend, and every time I used to call him, what's going on? I'm great. And at first, I used to get very irritated when he used to say, I say, you great, great, so all the time. You know, it, I sounded a little bit trite. But then I realized what he was saying. You have to speak. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And you shall eat the fruit thereof. So if you keep confessing that you're great, you will be great. If you say, how oh, you are, oh, hand to mouth and scarcely that, you will be hand to mouth and scarcely that. God doesn't like when people complain. That's, that's one of the, the, the contestants for the level say, you are a loser. You know? He don't like that loser mentality and things is always bad. The glass is always half full. You see, when you complain and you, 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 you murmur, it's really ingratitude, you know. It's ingratitude. And if you continue to complain and you continue to murmur, that ingratitude takes you into bitterness. You ever meet some people who are bitter? And the word of God talks about roots of bitterness. They go right down in your spirit and they tangle you up and wrap you up. And bitterness can lead to anger and even murder. So God wants to wipe away that complaining spirit from us today. Whatever it is, we, we should give thanks for it and bless God. That's what Paul said. Whatever state I find myself in, there to be contented. You know, we complain now when um, a little inconvenience, you know. The, the cable off. <laughs> cable off, or current, current off. You remember the days when it was lamp? The, all the older folks know, and you have to light your lamp. You get up in the morning and catch cold pot to catch the fire to make your breakfast to go to school. That wasn't so long ago. Amen. When you get a one lick of bread with the bread and cheese and the butter have to share for about three, four children and you're satisfied with it and you go to school. No, you complain if you don't have corn flakes. Get real. You have something. Be, let me tell you. When you have a heart of gratitude, you will never, ever be bitter. Because, you know, it flows through you. You get up this morning, you say, Lord, thank you. 
I, 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 can, I can get up. Some people up at Mount St. John, just out there put them to lie down. Last night, they're in the same position. I can move. We used to, when I was a child, there was no church boss. You had to walk to church. All the ladies know your shoe sealers scrape off fast. You had to walk on the stony road. There was no church bus to pick you up. No, you have a bus. Bless God, you're in the air condition. You remember the old sanctuary? Sister Charles, you remember how we used to give out paper towels because of the heat? The ushers used to walk around the sharing out paper towels because it was hot and we would sweat. But we love God. So thank God that we now have an AC and we're comfortable. God is a good God. God is faithful. You are looking so lovely and nice in your dan dan. God has been good. You remember when you had one shoes? Bless God. He's been good. Be grateful. You have your pick this one for that and that for that. God has been so good. If you just put your mind on how he's how he's kept you, he's provided for you, he's taken care of you, he's healed you, he's delivered you, he's been there for you, he's your all in all, oh come on, your shield, oh, your buckler, your strong tower, your very present help in the times of trouble. Think upon those things. When the tendency comes to murmur and complain about what you don't have. You know, I said, Lord, when I see the pictures of Haiti and I see the destruction, those people didn't have nothing to begin with. And you see how it's just torn away and they're just sitting there. I say, Lord, you've been good to Antigua and Barbuda. You've been good. You preserved Jamaica. You preserved so many of the countries. Thank you, Lord. He's greatly to be praised. When you complain, saints, you're basically telling God, you know, you, you made a mistake. You're not doing this thing right. You, you somehow dropped the ball, Lord. You're telling him that what he's done for you is not enough. You're telling him, well, okay, this little second-hand car, it's, it, it, you know, it's not as nice as some other people's car, and you don't like it, and you're murmuring it, but you're not walking. Amen? You didn't get the A-plus on the exam, but you got the C- minus, and it was enough to let you graduate. Bless God. He's good. When you complain, you ignore grace. You... <laughs> Oh, he's so great. God is so great. God, you're great today. And you're greatly to be praised. You remember in, in, uh, when Paul went into the city of um, Ephesus? The Ephesians used to worship Diana. They had a big temple in, in Ephesus um, where they would worship Diana. And Diana was the goddess of fertility and all that. And all these, these merchants used to make these little idols, Sister Farrell, and sell them. And they used to make good money. And Paul come, and the word of God talked about uh, because of the way. There was a tumult in the city. You know what the way is? Who is the way? Jesus Christ says, I am the truth, the life, the way. When the people heard about Jesus and understood about what he did for them and converted to Christianity, the whole tongue turned upside down. The men them come and say, we can't sell our liquor makuchu no more. Because the people in them now know the true and living God. He's not made with hands and stones, you know? who lives in a temple inside here. So they're not buying out things and we, well, the business is going broke. The cars are rioting in the city. They stood up and for two hours they say, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great. And they chant, Diana is dead. She can't hear, she can't see, she can't touch, and she can't feel. If you go to where modern day in Turkey you now and find where the temple was, it's in ruins. But Jesus Christ is alive and well. <laughs> and sitting at, the, at his father's right hand where the word says he ever liveth to what? Make intercession for us. Serve something that's living. Let the dead bury the dead. He's a great God. He's greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. That's what the word says. To praise him greatly is like what we did just after worship, wound down. To praise him long and to praise him loud. And don't tell me that you can't make noise because you're kind of a dignified. When Miami Heat's winning and you're watching the television, you make noise. 
When the votes were counted on election night and you heard your party win, you make noise. It's the truth. So you can make some noise for Jesus. Come on. We can be undignified for the Lord. You see, because he died that we can have life and have it more abundantly. And in heaven, praise is going on 24-7. So if you can't praise for two minutes down here, I don't know how you're going to make it up there. A serious noise in heaven. And God is not afraid of noise. God don't, oh, you make too much noise in my head. You know, we, 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 we must be exuberant in our praise. We must magnify our God. Because people magnify all the other gods that they have. Who are dead. And can't answer. Our oh, God don't wear no pajamas. He don't sleep. We don't have no siestas. He's God. What? A, can you imagine? Right now, all the billions of people in the world and the millions of Christians who are calling upon God, God, hearing everybody, answering, attentive, concerned. What a God who is greatly to be praised. Come on, put your hands together and bless him. Cures the dry times. You used to sing this song, Send Judah First. Y'all remember that? And the victory shall be won. Send Judah first. And the foe is overcome. We sing glory to the Father. Sing glory to the Son. Send Judah first. You remember we just spoke about Jehoshaphat in Chronicles 20? I didn't mention the party, but that's what he did. The, the, the high priest said, look, let me tell you all something. Stand still, right? Let's see the salvation of God. We don't have to do any fighting today. This is what God is saying. Send the choir first. So they assembled the trumpeters and the choir, and they started to praise, and they magnified God. And it's when they started to praise God that the word says ambushments were sent in the camp of the enemy, and they started to turn on each other. When you start to praise God, your enemies get confused. Or as we say in Antigua, their brains get buzzy they get foolish. They start to contradict each other. And conf- they, they get confounded. That's what the praise does in the, in the spirit. When you see, the, the war is not flesh enough. It's, it's a heavenly war. And that's where we need to fight it and win it. So if you're facing today some insurmountable obstacle, saints of God. Yeah? And you're losing all hope of victory. And you feel overwhelmed and you feel powerless. Run into the strong tower. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob answer you in the day of trouble today. The word of God says some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of our God. One of his names is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. He's the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Never lost a battle yet. His word for you today, if you give him a greatly praise, he will show up as the Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord strong and mighty in battle. Do not be dismayed, saints, for the battle is not yours today. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. You will overcome the enemy. You will overcome the foe. There are three principles that I want you to get out of Second Chronicles 20. The first thing Jehoshaphat did, he proclaimed a fast. And he's not trying to manipulate God. He's trying to show God how sincere you are. Your dependency on him. Lord, I'm not eating no food. Because I'm, go- I'm doubling down now. I need to hear from you. I need to seek you. He called a prayer, prayer meeting. They prayed. Amen? They fasted. They prayed. And they praised. And the enemy was put to flight. And the enemy was destroyed. Give God a greatly praise today. For destroying the enemy. For going before us and to trust in them out of the land so that his people are victorious in the name of Jesus. The fourth thing I want you to, to note this morning is this. A great God designed a great creation. Because he, naturally he's great. He designed a great creation. And let's give you a few examples of his greatness. Water. Have you ever wondered why this is the only planet in the universe where they have found water? Water is the essence of life. It dissolves rocks. It, it has the, the plankton in it that um, gives off the, has the, the, the food chain that starts at the bottom of the food chain that builds right up. 
it, it waters the land as rain so that the trees can grow, so that we can have food to eat, so that they can blossom. It starts the whole process. As snow, it stores up water. And do you know, this is, a lot of people don't, don't realize that, do you know that water, when it freezes, is actually lighter than when it is in a liquid state? And you know why God designed it that way? If water froze from the bottom up, instead of from the top, all the fish and all the life would freeze. But God is so good and so gracious and so careful in his creation. He designed it so even though the lakes may freeze, even though um, the, the tops of some seas will freeze, right at the bottom is still liquid. So life continues because of the greatness of our God in creation. Amen? You ever thought about the moon? Psalm 104 verse 19. He appointed the moon for seasons and the sun knew at his time to go down. Saints of God, you see that beautiful full moon that was out last night? That is what causes the tides to pull up and to go down. And if there was no moon pulling the tides, the whole thing would be like a cesspool and it would stink. It's the tides refreshing and breaking on the shore that aerates the ocean that causes life, the motion, the movement to continue on this planet. The very angle that the earth is tilted on its axis causes us to have equal times, day, night, spring, summer, winter. If it was one degree one way, the whole place would either burn up, or if it was one degree the other way, the whole place would freeze up. What a God! What a master, genius creator! Don't let nobody tell you you come from no monkey. The devil is a liar! Why people not changing and continuing to change into something else? Why are the monkeys that they know not changing into people? Let me tell you, see, know God for yourself. Search his word. Everything is in here that you need to know. And just be open to it. He's a good God. He, he's a great God and he makes a great creation. And I want to come the final apex of his creation was mankind. Do you know how unique and wonderful you are? When you go home, look into a mirror. Look in your eyes. The irises in your eye. Some people have black, some are blue, some are green, and now you can have any color you like. You can buy some contacts, and if you want purple irises, you get them. And it's your iris because you paid for it yourself. So don't let nobody trouble you about that. Amen? But the folds and the patterns on the iris of your eye, pastor, is unique to you. Of all the billions of, this, of people on the planet, nobody have the same iris pattern. What a God. You don't think he'd have run out a pattern by no? Hallelujah, no! He's great! Those things just blow my mind. And people want to tell you that that is by chance? Your car, this tablet here, this iPad, somebody created it. Somebody created the rustum. Somebody created this piece of paper, the clothes that I'm wearing. And you want to tell me that I started as a, like a single cell and swim out of the sea and then start to creep and then turn to something else. Like, no, I'm fearful and wonderfully made in the image of my God because I serve a great God. It's right there in the word. You, for, you formed my inward path and you covered me in my mother's womb. Psalm 139, verse 13. Since you're in your mommy belly, he's shaping you and knitting you and know everything about you. The hairs on your head, bless God and numbered. So he can say, um, Pastor Shervin, 10,800,526. Pastor Pell, and he can tell you how much hair on your head. He know them. He numbers them. He pays attention to detail because you're unique to him. You're in your creation. So unique that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. A great God has a great creation. Amen? The fifth point of note today, saints, is that his great creation will accomplish great things. You know, God says, whoever believes in me will do the work that I am doing, and he will even do greater works after I'm gone. You see, when God created you, saints, he had a plan for your life, purpose for your life. So I want to guard against the indifference and guard against the thought that you don't matter and, you know, it's, it's no. You're unique. There are things that only you 
have been ordained to do on this planet, but I. So you have to understand and see God to find out his purpose for your life and to make sure that when you close your eyes and you leave this planet, you will have one fulfilled purpose. And two, come to know him as Savior. That's critical and that's key. God wants you to get to be lined up with his plans, not necessarily yours. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's purpose is what must prevail at the end of the day. We all have our plans, but let's get in, in agreement with God's plans and what he wants to do. And you will know when you are lining up with God's purpose and God's plan, you know, because you have a passion for it. Amen? There's a fire that's like shut up in your bones. That's what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 20, verse 9. He says, that word is like a burning fire shut up within my bones. He had to get it out. The people them tell Jeremiah, just look, you just chill. Don't make no noise. Don't go up, up there and don't preach and tell them. No, I have to say it. If I don't say it, I won't catch a fire. His word is like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. I can't hold it back. That's when you know your plan is lining up with God's plan. Amen. He will show you the right path to take. He will make darkness light and he will make crooked places straight for you. Because you're lining up with his plan. The word says the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord. So he will tell you, saints of God, when to go straight, when to go to the left, when to go to the right, or when just to stand up. He will tell you when to speak, when to shut your mouth, when to, to, to just, he will direct your steps. He will, he will guard you. He will pilot you. Amen? So in order for you to achieve those great things as his creation, he has purpose for you to follow his plan and his purpose for your life. In order for you to do those great things for your life, sometimes he favors you. You know, when you study the life of a lot of successful people, you will find that um, they had vision, they had patience, they had determination, they had the strength of character, but they also had people who gave them a break. Somebody who took a chance on them. So just as somebody took a chance on you, you ought to take chances on people. You ought not to write people off. God will position people to open doors for you that no man can shut. You know, the, um, the, the, the writer Alex Haley, who wrote the book Roots, they said he had a picture in his study of um, a turtle sitting on top of a fence post. And the caption underneath of it was, you can bet he didn't get there by himself. What am I saying? Somebody has to help somebody. We all need each other. We all need somebody to, to help you and give you a, a hand and to lift you and to encourage you to take you on for you to fulfill the purpose that God has in your life. It's not a one-man band thing. Amen? I just wanted just, just, just to drop that into your spirit. God will open doors for you. He, he says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. You remember Nehemiah? Nehemiah said, look, Lord, let me go back and rebuild this broken city of Jerusalem. And he allowed the king to give him resources. He says, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. And the king did. He will grant you favor to accomplish the purpose that he has set out for your life. So, you know, you, you, don't, you can't dictate to God who he can use to bless you. Remember Elijah in the desert? He sent a raven to give Elijah bread. A raven was a scavenger, nasty bird. Elijah could have said, you're unclean, I'm not eating the bread. But he would have died. What is God saying? Whoever he uses to bless you, he's sovereign. Amen. And God likes to make... Um, he likes to make heathen kings stand up and confess him and bless him. Because that's the kind of God he is. And once you're yielded to him, saints of God, he's going to use you to do great things for his kingdom. His great creation. And you are the apex of that great creation. Will accomplish great things for the Lord. We're going to do great things. I believe it right down in my heart in this nation of Antigua and Barbuda. That this assembly will be known in the heavenlies will be known in the realms of darkness as a warrior church, but we will also be known in this nation of doing great things for God. 
of transforming lives, of being a stand in the gap assembly of believers, a praying true church, a church that will stand up and tell the hurricane, shift so. A church that will command the earth, you are not going to shake and destroy people's lives and homes. A church that's going to say, no terrorist going to come here and blow up no bomb. Not this Antigua and Barbuda. We will decree, decree and declare things in the word of God that so they shall be established. That is the kind of church God coming back for. Not no lukewarm, canty mode. Oh, by in the sweet, by and by. No. Army. Strong. We're going down with our boots on. Be strong and, 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 and powerful in God and being able to, 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 to fight. It's from the days of John the Baptist, this thing fighting now, this thing going on. Until the time right now, the word of God says that the kingdom of God take, take it by force, by violence. We, we, the enemy not asking for no quarter. If you think that the devil is going to just leave you alone, no. His mission is to treat him, kill, steal, and destroy. That's wicked now. Take away everything we have. Murder you until burn down your house. That's wicked. And that is the kind of, that's the kind of enemy he is. But we have to know how to fight. We know whom we believe. And we know that our fights are not carnal. Then they're not natural. But the, the weapons of a warfare that we use are mighty to pull down strongholds. And to advance the kingdom of God. That's our mission. And that's our pledge. Amen? The six point saints as we move forward is that a great God does miracles so great. You need a miracle today? Let me see. All who need a miracle. Are you in a wilderness area that you need the God to come to for you? You know what a wilderness is? It's a really rough place now in a rough time. The children of Israel wandered around in the wilderness for a long, long time. A wilderness is a place where no water is, where no sustenance is, where you're halfway to where you're supposed to be. You're out of the, the, the Egypt, but you're not into the promised land yet. A lot of us are in a kind of wilderness experience. And it's not fun. Well, that's where the miracles happen. That's where the water came out of the rock. Amen? That's where you got meat to eat. That's where you had a pillar of cloud by day to guide you and one by fire by night. That's where God shows up. I don't know what your wilderness experience is. For some, it might have been the day when you look at the, the burnt out rubble of your home after a fire went through. Or when you look at the scraps of wood and galvanized after the hurricane came through. Or when you looked at the person who you thought was the love of your life just as they walk away from you. Or when you look at the children, you look at the pictures and the phone don't ring anymore and the, nobody comes to visit and you're elderly and you're on your own and you're lonely. And it's a wilderness experience, or it's a, a, a bedroom that brings back the childhood memories of when somebody took away your innocence, or um, it's, it's, it's the going the last day when you have to leave and pack up out of a home that you can't no longer pay for, and the bank is taken away. It's a wilderness experience, but there's hope in God. There is strength in God. There's miracles in God. And God does miracles great. It's a place where God shows up and shows up in a tangible way. You see, when miracles come, they prove that God exists and they prove that he is the true God. You remember when the children of Israel were in Egypt and, and Moses did some crazy miracles? The Nile turned into blood, you remember? And for three days, there was darkness. The sun didn't shine. There was darkness. God was not only showing who he is, but he is also triumphing over the gods of the Nile and the gods of the sun that the Egyptians used to worship after. God was showing, let me show you. worship the sun. Sun don't shine for three days. So God put him on lockdown. And you know the beauty about it? While Egypt was in darkness, there was light in Goshen. God will cause famine to be in a land and in your house there's abundance because that's the kind of God he is. He does miracles so great. 
We sing it all the time. I want us when we sing, we sing with understanding. And when we go and delve into the word, we, it, it really forms deep roots in our hearts so we know what we're saying and what we're confessing and what we're believing and we stand on God's word. When he does miracles so great, they are con there's conclusive evidence that a miracle has occurred. There's a before and there's an after. There's a report from the doctor that says whatever the carcinoma is, stage whatever, whatever. And then there's another one that says no cancer, nothing can be found. Amen? You know, when the, when the man was blind, everybody knew the man was blind from birth. That Jesus healed in John 9. And he go, told him to go to the pool of Shiloh and what? Everybody knew the man. So afterwards, people know the man was blind, but now he can see. It's some conclusive evidence that there's been a change. When you meet the man Christ Jesus, things change. If the deliverer shows up here, chains begin to fall off. Blind eyes get opened. People get saved. People get healed because he's a healer. He comes with everything. He does miracles, great saints of God. That's why we can give him glory. That's why we can give him praise. That's why we can lift up holy hands and magnify him. Because he's a great God. There's nothing too hard for him to do today. I don't know what the miracle that you believe in God for. But he's here today. And he will move on your behalf. Because he's God. He doesn't have to ask anybody's permission. He just has to see your heart. And he will answer. The seventh and the final word that I want to leave with God's people this, this afternoon. Is that our great God has great grace. But don't walk on it. Don't walk on the grace. You know, we always say this little prayer when we eat our meals. It's grace before meals. It's just saying thanks. It's just, just, just showing gratitude to God for providing a meal, for taking care of you. But it's also symbolic of the grace that he came to give us. The unmerited favor that he came to die for us when we were unlovable, unwanted, and to bring us back into relationship with the Father. And since the measure of grace that's upon your life is decided by God. We have different gifts. We have different anointings. But it's the same grace. And once you realize what God has given you, you can begin to accept it freely and you can flow in it and you can use that grace that's upon your life to minister to others. People who have gone through stuff can deal with that stuff for other people. That's what I'm saying. God's grace is on your lives today. He has saved you. He has healed you. He has turned you around. And he wants you to use that grace to minister to others and to point them to the Savior. This grace helps you to deal with difficult situations. His grace is sufficient for us. No matter what you're going through, I want to let you know that that grace is sufficient for you. But as God extends grace... Don't trample on it. You know, this hymn writer, um, her name was Annie Johnson Flint, and she composed the hymn, He Give It More Grace When the Burdens Grow Greater. He added more strength when the labors increase. To add added affliction, he added his mercy. To multiply trials, he multiplied peace. His love had no limit. Oh, bless God. His grace had no measure. His power had no boundaries known unto man. But out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he gave and he gave and he gave again. That's the grace of God. Keeps giving. It's a grace that keeps giving and keep giving and keep giving. Because he loves mankind. He loves people. But the word says in Hebrews 10, 28, 29, anyone who rejects the law of Moses died without mercy and the testimony of two or three witnesses. And how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God on the, go on the foot and who has treated as an unholy thing the blood and the covenant that sanctified them once they have insulted 
the spirit of grace. Once God, you see, once God has given that grace over and over again, and you reject it, and you reject it, and you reject it, you're trampling upon the grace of God. You're walking on it. On it. You're thinking of it as a, a common thing. It's not holy. It doesn't mean anything to you. And even as this word is going out about great grace, I can feel there is great conviction in the house of God. I can feel the conviction even on the airwaves as this word would go out. God wants to heal. He wants to restore. He wants to deliver. He wants to save. But he also wants to let you know, do not reject his grace. Do not trample upon his grace. You see? Because you can reject and you can reject and you can push back until one day you become like Esau and you cannot repent. Or you become like Ephraim, you're tied to idols. And God just says, just leave him alone. Leave her alone. She's tied to an idol. My prayer today, saints of God, even as the worship team comes back now, and we wrap up, is that this great conviction will point you towards God's great grace and great mercy. Not condemnation, but conviction. That the great grace is greater than all our sin. And that the great grace will cleanse and will pardon and will transform you and bring you back to God. Bring you home to God. Never to roam again. Never to leave him again. It's a great grace. You know, the greatest miracle, we talked about God being miraculous. But the greatest miracle of our great God is a life that's transformed, you know. Amen? Passing from death to life. Passing from darkness to light. When you get to a point in your life, when you lay it all down, and you give it to Jesus. There's great grace in this house today because we serve a great God who wants to restore, who wants to heal, who wants to encourage, who wants to be all in all to you today. So as you stand, I ask that you be in prayer. Thank you.